Good evening, Church of the Living Hope. If we could bring our conversations to a close and come expecting to meet the Lord, to enter into his presence. Lord, we just, we ask you to fill our hearts, God. We need you, Lord. We need your grace alive in our heart. We need your resurrection alive in us. Lord, we, we knock and we seek after you, Lord. We search for you as for hidden treasure tonight, Lord. That's what we're here for is to, to honor you, God, to glorify your name. Strengthen our hearts, we pray, Lord. Encourage our hearts. We need your help, Lord. We need your encouragement. In Jesus' name. Father's love descended from the throne above, author of salvation, giver of new life, crucified to pay for sin, our righteousness is in the name of
to Jesus I surrender all to Him I freely give I will ever love and trust Him in His presence daily
to thee, my blessed Savior, I surrender all. First Chronicles 28.9, it says, And you, Solomon, my son, know God of your father, and serve him with a whole heart and with a willing mind. For the Lord searches all hearts and understands every plan and thought. If you seek him, he will be found by you. But if you forsake him, he will cast you off forever. Be careful now, for the Lord has chosen you to build a house for the sanctuary, to be strong and do it. Father, we thank you for the word of life. Father, we thank you that you are the discerner of every thought and the knower of everything, Lord, that we desire and seek. Lord, that you say that you know the inclination of every heart. And Lord, we just say in the words of David, Lord, would you search us and know us? Would you try our thoughts, Lord, and know every anxious thought, Lord? Would you know the deepest parts and reveal that to us, Lord, as we as we pause, Lord, and as we as we sing, I surrender to you, Lord, that we would we would remember, Lord God, that you are the God of all knowledge. Lord, that there's nothing hidden from your eyes. There's no sin left uncovered. There's no, there's nothing, Lord God, that deceives you, Lord God. You know our hearts, Lord. You know where we're at right now, God. And Lord, we're asking that you would reveal it to us, Lord. That you would reveal our hearts to us, Lord. That you would reveal our nature before you, Lord, so that we could be purified, that we could be blameless in your sight. Lord, we want to be sons and daughters that are fully pleasing to you, God. We desire, Lord, holiness in our lives. Lord, we ask for sanctification, Lord. We ask for the sword, the spirit, the word of God to cut and slice and remove everything, Lord, that does not belong in us, Lord. Lord, that you would begin to cut away the things of the flesh and remove it from our hearts, Lord. That you would keep in us a heart of flesh, Lord, that you'd remove a heart of stone, Lord, for those of us who've become numb or accustomed to religion or, or just trying to do good in our own actions, Lord. We just pray that you would slice to our hearts, Lord, by the word of God, by the sword of the Spirit, Lord, that you discern our hearts and our thoughts tonight, Lord, that you make it known to us, Lord, so that our hearts and our lives and everything that comes out of our lives will be fully pleasing to you, God that we could have a life like David that was, Lord, fully pleasing to you, Lord, a man and a woman after your own heart, God. That's what I want, God. That's what we want, Lord, is to be men and women at the end of our lives, Lord, that you would say, that was a man and a woman after my own heart. They fully devoted themselves to my will, and we just claim that, Lord, over our lives, Lord, whether we're there or we want to be, Lord. Let your will be done in our lives, Lord. Would you be fully pleasing? Lord, would we be fully pleasing to you, God, that we would be that servant that you'd say, well done, well done. Search us out tonight, Lord. Jesus' name. that shines strong and bright and it takes me by surprise swept up in the flow now I can't let go but this strangely feels like home and there's a shines strong and bright and it takes me by surprise swept up in the flow now I can't let go but this strangely feels like home I've been caught up Oh my. 
my cares are falling off now And this joy I can't explain I've been caught up in mercy I've been caught up joy I can't explain. And now I start to see that this majesty was designed, prepared for me. It was a voice I hear so
deserving of you, Lord. But he lifts my head and he smiles and says, because I love you and you're mine, I start to cry. And now I start to cry, because how could I? Be deserving of you, Lord. It's your lift my head, and he smiles and says, Cause I love you, and you're mine. I've been caught, I've been caught up in mercy. I've been caught up in grace. Oh, my kids are falling off now. And this joy I can't explain. I've been caught. Use 
Lord. So we were worshiping and thanking the Lord for his grace and for his mercy. That's an especially blessed thing to thank the Lord for and to worship him for. <laughs> this truth that we are saved by the work of Jesus Christ on the cross, His work, by His work. And, and let that never be lost on us, right? Amen? Let that never be lost on us. And let us be especially thankful for it again tonight. It's taught all throughout. It's, it's especially revealed and explained very well in the New Testament, but of course it was already being taught and prophesied in the Old Testament. That Jesus would save us by faith and by grace. If you're grateful for that, just give him a hallelujah. It's not, it's what he has done. His work it's what Christ has done. And maybe, maybe there is someone here that's just struggling. It's like, I don't even know if I can be saved. I don't even know. Maybe someone's here tonight that's in that struggle. Let me explain it to you again. That, that the word says that all have fallen short of the glory of God. That's what Romans teaches. And in Ephesians teaches that we are saved by faith and not of works, lest any man should boast. And that is something that is a miracle of God. And so let me testify to you that Jesus can save you right now. Call on him. Call on him. Call on him tonight. Call on him. 
He wants to meet you right where you're at. Right where you're at. It's His grace and mercy, which was something so scandalous, by the way. I should note that. When you read in the Gospels, Jesus wanting to save sinners was such a scandalous thing. And let me tell you what, it's the most beautiful thing. And we get to see it all the time. Thank you, Lord, for saving sinners. Thank you, Lord, for saving people and giving them a new heart and a new spirit. That is a work of grace. And, we, and the worship song you led us in tonight sang about that so powerfully. Let's just turn that again into a prayer and, and a thank, uh, prayer of thanksgiving. Lord, we are so thankful for your grace and for your mercy. It is not deserved. And let us have a clear picture of that again tonight. Let us have a clear picture of that again tonight. Lord, I pray, I pray for those here that uh, are saved, I pray, Lord, it would just bring thanksgiving again uh, into our hearts and thankfulness and gratitude. Lord, if there is someone here, someone listening online that is struggling with even believing that you could touch them and you could transform them, Lord, let them know that you can. It is a miracle of God. It is not because of who they are. It is not because of their position. It is not because of something that they've done. It's because of your grace. It's because of your mercy. It's because of who you are and what you've done on the cross and rising from the dead. It is your work that saves us. And I pray, Lord, that they would just call on you again and see your miracle in their life. And we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Salvation belongs to the Lord. Amen. Amen. You can be seated. We just welcome everyone to Church of Living Hope. We're so grateful to worship together tonight. Thankful for our worship team leading us and doing such an excellent job. We're so thankful for that. We're going to have our Bible studies. A Wednesday night is a big teaching night here at Church of Living Hope. And of course, we have um, kids' ministries for all ages. Perhaps everyone in here already knew that. It's worth noting. And we're so thankful. I think that the young boys that are usually outside are probably not outside. They probably found a, probably found a roof at this point. But hopefully. So we're going to dismiss to the youth. Bible, and they'll have their Bible study and group meeting tonight at the Christian Education Building. We have a Spanish Bible study, all in Spanish, if you're interested in that. And I see Brother Mark Simpson in the back. You can follow him to the Christian Education Building as well. We also have a, a special Bible study on prayer. And Randall has his hand up there. You can follow him if you would like to participate in that. For uh, the regular adult English-speaking Bible study, we have been going through the book of Genesis Verse by verse, chapter by chapter, we're in ver uh, excuse me, we're in chapter forty-eight tonight. Chapter forty-eight, and we are coming to the end of Genesis real quick. It's happening. I think this thing shrunk. There we go. We are getting to the last of many things here. Chapter 48. So at this point, Jacob's entire family, Israel, his name is Israel. Jacob, the Bible, of course, he has a new name, Israel, and the Bible continually refers to him as both. It'll switch. Many times we just call him Jacob when we're kind of talking about the man, when we're kind of talking about his nation that he 
that came from him. We refer to him as Israel. You could use either name, of course. It is his new name for sure. But his whole family has arrived um, and they have moved to this area of Goshen. And we're told that Jacob again lives another 17 years there. That was at the last verses of chapter 47. We saw it there in verse 28. And Jacob lived in the land of Egypt 17 years. So that was again another long time for him. And and it is an interesting uh, kind of a... I don't know if a theme is the right word. It's kind of the first word that comes to mind. That the patriarchs all seem to think they were dying a little bit ahead of their schedule. (laughs) I don't know. Maybe there's a message in that somewhere. And, uh, of course, he thought he was going to die just getting there. He lives another 17 years. But now we're coming to his actual death. So, let's start... Um, reading that, and there's just some wonderful things, some beautiful things, some definitely um, spiritual things for us to learn um, that's going to take place really over the next two chapters. It starts with Joseph's sons. And so he'll, he, let's set the setting He is passing away for sure now. He must be well aware of it. It must be more clear. And um, he's calling for his children. And he's calling for them to give them his blessing. Now, if you'll remember, we've been seeing this now all throughout the book of Genesis. And this is a biblical concept. And in this biblical concept, the father blesses the children and he uses his words to do it. And there is like a prophetic edge to it where he blesses them, pronounces his blessing on them, and God fulfills it and more in their lives. And I think one of the things that we can understand a little bit in modern is in our modern day is the concept of an inheritance uh, where we receive something physical uh, from a deceased parent sometimes right in the modern economy maybe less now than ever i mean that's just a reality i'm kind of being funny about it but it's not funny and so And the Bible shows there's this more to it. (laughs) This blessing from the Father to the children. The spiritual blessing. This this inheritance that isn't material. (laughs) This, This blessing of God. This abundance. And there's other concepts too at play. We'll note them as well. We've already we've touched on these in prior stories as well. But there is there is a it's already a principle before the law, and then it becomes a statute in the law for the firstborn to receive a greater inheritance. Some people even talk about the double portion um, for the firstborn. It's interesting here, and it's we're watching it, we're going to read it. He calls for Joseph. And he calls for his boys. And really, we probably could do two chapters. I don't think Sometimes we've really struggled to get through two chapters, so we're not going to. 
But in this chapter, he is going to first bless the children of Joseph. First. And there is a very real sense that these boys, particularly Ephraim, gets the greatest blessing. And if, if you'll remember the history of his children, his two firstborn children caused a lot of trouble. And they essentially lose that place. And then we'll see it next week. But he has some... This is like this blessing time. And some of the words he has for some of those boys is really a, almost like a judgment. Um, almost, almost like a judgment for unrepentant sin. It's interesting. So let's look at it together. Now it came to pass after these things that Joseph was told, Indeed, your father's sick. And he took with him his two sons, Manasseh and Ephraim. Let me just note here. Um, of course, when he got married, he was about 20. And all the things that I could read about this put him in his 50s, possibly 56, 57 years old. Joseph. Okay. Which, okay, let's see it. Okay, now it came to pass... He's bringing his sons. So they would have been probably young adults. And Jacob was told, Look, your son Joseph is coming to you. And Israel strengthened himself and set up on the bed. Then Jacob said to Joseph, God Almighty appeared to me at Luz in the land of Canaan and blessed me and said to me, Behold, I will make you fruitful and multiply you. And I will make of you a multitude of people and give this land to your descendants after you as an everlasting possession. And now your two sons, Ephraim and Manasseh, who were born to you in the land of Egypt before I came to you in Egypt, are mine. As Reuben and Simeon, they shall be mine. Your offspring whom you beget after them shall be yours. They will be called by the name of their brothers in their inheritance. But as for me, when I came from Padan, Rachel died beside me in the land of Canaan on the way, when there was but a little distance to go to Ephrath. And I buried her there on the way to Ephrath, that is Bethlehem. So it's an interesting, it's really... It's a, an adoption. It's, a, it's what's taking place here where these boys actually become lineage of Israel. And of course, which I think most everyone in here knows, that these two boys become key tribes in the tribes of Israel. And so it's like this ad adoption is probably the correct word, maybe... Maybe there's a more specific word there. Um, he even says to Joseph, if you have more children, they'll be yours. <laughs> if you have any more kids, they could call them yours. But these two boys, which are really his grandsons, are mine. <laughs> but it wasn't a bad thing. It was a beautiful thing. And really, we have some neat points here that I want to do at the end of the Bible study. But Joseph's story speaks to us in so many ways. And Joseph's story is a story of a man that feared the Lord and obeyed the Lord despite incredible difficulty. And he is blessed. <laughs> Joseph is blessed. <laughs> And these boys are blessed. <laughs> and they become these key tribes and, and really become 
adopted, I guess is probably the correct word, uh, to, to Jacob. And then they get this blessing. And this is something that, I, that I'm trying to communicate here tonight, is, is that we, we have such a great ability to bless our children, spiritually and physically, of course. But it's more than than an ability. It's really a duty. <laughs> and and we're seeing it played out here that there are things that we must pass down to our children. We are actually agents of blessing to our children and our descendants. And Jacob is showing that to us here. Really, it's interesting that this adoption almost replaces Joseph, and it's to Joseph's benefit. But he is he there's no tribe of Joseph in the tribes of Israel. These two boys replace him uh, in that family line. And really, I believe when you read it in context, they replace the original firstborn, which would be, now I should know this, I'm just reading it, um, Reuben would be the firstborn, and Simeon, I believe, would be the secondborn. So let's keep reading it. Then Israel saw Joseph's sons and said, Who are these? Joseph said to his father, these are, They are my sons whom God has given me in this place. And he said, "Bring them, Please bring them to me, and I will bless them. Now the eyes of Israel were dim with age so that he could not see. Then Joseph brought them near him, and he kissed them and embraced them. And Israel said to Joseph, I had not thought to see your face, but in fact God has also shown me your offspring. So Joseph brought them from beside his knees, and he bowed down with his face to the earth. And Joseph took them both, Ephraim with his right hand towards Israel's left hand, and Manasseh with his left hand towards Israel's right hand, and brought them near him. Then Israel stretched out his right hand, and laid it on Ephraim's head, who was the younger, and his left hand on Manasseh's head, guiding his hands knowingly, for Manasseh was the firstborn. And he blessed Joseph and said, God, before whom my fathers and Abraham walked, the God who has fed me all my life long to this day, the angel who has redeemed me from all evil, bless the lads. Let my name be named upon them, and the name of my fathers, Abraham and Isaac, and let them grow into a multitude in the midst of the earth. I'm sure we all caught it, but he's coming up to bless them like this, and he does that. <laughs> so, the, you know, he's bringing up the two boys, and... Jacob just switches his hands like, yeah, he did the old wah. And because, and again, this is, it's, um, it's cultural. There is a biblical, uh, what's the word, metaphor, I guess. Some of these words I struggle with sometimes where the right hand has meaning. And there's nothing against left-handed people. My wife's left-handed. Okay, left, left, right here. Nothing against the lefties. It's, it's, it's not about that, really. Okay. <laughs> but the right hand is the right, the right hand is the right hand. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Yeah, it's symbolic. It's symbolic. That's the word I was looking for. Thank you, Jesus. 
Symbolism. That's what I'm looking for. And the right hand symbolizes several things. Authority is, is a key one. For whatever reason, right hand and power. Um, in fact, as we know, Jesus now sits where? At the right hand of the Father. So it's like a symbol of authority. Um, and so he's bringing the firstborn up to the right hand. You know, it's symbolism, but it's meaningful, right? Yes, with the power. Yes, Bonnie, correct. So, he's bringing the, the boy up to the right hand. That's where we're headed with this. And he switches it to the younger boy, the younger man, man boy. And he's, he switches it. And he blesses, which what's going on there is the younger boy is getting the greater blessing. Which again, I think should speak to us again tonight. It, and isn't it amazing that God doesn't always choose who we think he's going to choose, does he? And he's looking at the heart, isn't he? And he, he is, it's not always about external things, right? Not about position, well, this sounds like what we're talking about, the grace and mercy of God. Amen? Aren't you glad that he didn't choose who everybody else thought he would choose? Aren't you glad that he chose a sinner like you? Aren't you glad that he had mercy on, on, on a person like us? And it didn't look right on the outside. Let me tell you what. There are days when I think about it, and I just want to cry because of, I can't believe how God saved me. I'm talking about my personal story now, but hopefully you can relate. And there have been times recently, really, where I thought about, because I, before I was saved, y'all know I was saved in prison, so I was part of some criminal activity. And I think about some of the criminal things, and it just breaks my heart. It breaks my heart. Because sometimes you think, well, I'm just, let's use theft, for example. Well, I'm just stealing something. This doesn't hurt anybody. It hurts a lot of people. It hurts a lot of people. Um. Our founding pastor, Pastor Joe Foss, sometimes he tells stories about when he used to run a um, a store and how the people would, would take the money from him and how much that hurt him personally. You think, oh, I'm not hurting anybody. You, if when 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 we do these things, it hurts, and anyway, I'm trying not, try not to get too far off track. What I'm trying to say is, when I think about how God looked on a man like that and brought mercy into my life and to all of our lives that are here tonight, in whatever way your story, you have your own story, He didn't choose who man thought that he should choose. Amen? Thank you, Lord. And we're grateful for that. And now I'm closed my notes. I don't even know what is going on up here. Thank you, Lord. So... He's, yeah, he switched them. Okay. 
So we'll see Joseph gets kind of upset or whatever. <laughs> like, you got the wrong boy. <laughs> That's what goes on here. He's like, hey, hey, dad, dad, dad. Stop with the stop with the switchy thing. Ver, verse 17. Now when Joseph saw that his father laid his right hand on the head of Ephraim, it displeased him. So he took hold of his dad's hand. It's like, no, 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 no. <laughs> he grabbed his hand. <laughs> he grabbed his hand. So he took hold of his father's hand to remove it from Ephraim's head to Manasseh's head. And Joseph said to his father, Not so, my father, for this one is the firstborn. Put your right hand on his head. But his father refused. And said, I know, my son. I know. He also shall become a people, and he shall also be great. But truly, his younger brothers shall be greater than he, and his descendants shall become a multitude of nations. You know what this also reminds me of? This reminds me of how the Jews have rejected the Christ Jesus this reminds me of that and how the Gentiles who were second <laughs> right <laughs> have been blessed by salvation hallelujah he says but the younger brother shall be greater than he and his descendants shall become a multitude of nations So he blessed them that day, saying, By Israel will bless, saying, May God make you as Ephraim and Manasseh. And thus he set Ephraim before Manasseh. Which, when you get into the kings and into the prophets, sometimes... The entire northern nation is called Ephraim. But perhaps many of you have read that before. Ephraim becomes such a strong tribe that sometimes that whole nation is just called, instead of, instead of being called Israel, it's called Ephraim. It's interesting how strong this blessing is. May God make you as Ephraim and as Manasseh. And thus he set Ephraim before Manasseh. Then Israel said to Joseph, Behold, I am dying, but God will be with you and bring you back to the land of your fathers. Moreover, I have given you one portion above your brothers, which I took from the hand of the Amorite with my sword and my bow. It's a, a kind of a curious statement there at the end. Um there's n there's not a battle uh, necessarily recorded so and some people have theorized that he did perhaps had to have fought a man um we'll leave that up to you and the holy spirit on that one <laughs> but he definitely says he sounded like he fought some guy with a sword and a bow but anyway that's how he ends that's how he ends his blessing on these two young boys that really end up becoming the top blessing. And then he'll go on to blessing his other sons, which some of those blessings are kind of tough. <laughs> but anyway, we'll get to that next week. So we're going to split into our small groups for the night. If you've been joining us online, I hope you are blessed by tonight's Bible study. And we thank you and wish you good night. Okay.